Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California, you're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Season 8 of Unsugarcoated with Alia. I'm so happy to be back here sharing uh, so many good new, good things that have happened over the hiatus. I appreciate you guys coming back. A couple things I want to go over. So thank you for spreading the word. Uh, I'm very excited. I recently learned that Unsugarcoated with Alia is actually globally ranked as one of the top 5% podcasts. That just makes my heart extremely grateful and thankful because that means we're doing something right. Uh, For those of you who have been listening and for those of you who are new, this is a powerful and uplifting call to wake up and let go of the past and transform ourselves into the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And what I try to do through this podcast is bring conversations to you that will create empathy, that will hopefully give you some education as well as inspiration because, you know, we all can use a little bit more of that. Like every season, I do a theme, and the theme for this season is Grow With The Flow. I was recently in Maui. My husband has a film that was shooting there, and I was so excited to go. Maui has these amazing healing properties, even the iron in the volcanic rock. So for me, as a person who, you know, for those of you who know, deal with certain disabilities and issues with my health, being in Maui was just you know, a state for me. I wanted to get my feet in the ground. I wanted to feel that healing energy. I wanted to reconnect with the earth. And it came to me that life often feels like we are a surfer on a surfboard. And some of us, we can manage that wave really well. And then every so often the wave comes, knocks us off our butts. A a good surfer is going to know how to go with the wave and then be able to get back up on that surfboard and get back up on the next wave. To me, and I'm sure to you, you can relate when I say that life, it's a wave we're trying to ride, right? And I want to be on top of the wave. And for me, the theme is growing with the flow. And so when we fall, when we, how do we stay in that state of flow? Many ways. One of them is actually doing what I was talking about, grounding, the meditation, all the things. And honestly, I feel like for me, it's taking a step back and looking at what I'm going through. What are the things that I have learned? What can I do better? And what benefits has this brought me? So those are some things that I want you to think about. I also want to remind you that you are a beautiful freaking miracle. I know I am. I know you are. I need you to walk in that. And yeah, so with that, I'm going to get uh, started into the introduction of our amazing guest. I also do want to remind you that I'm on Clubhouse now. Every Wednesday, I have a live version of Unsugarcoated with Alia. That's at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'd also love to give a shout out because I'm also on there with Worldwide Radio. Shout out to Tony Pizarro, Jay Tap, I Am Fame, Haley Haley, The Holy Goldie, all these amazing people, Nina 13, that I'm on there every morning bringing you music with motivation and positivity. So very, very exciting. As the founder of Unsugarcoated Media, I purposefully use my school skills and abilities as a leader and as a businesswoman to create social impact through this organization. As a novelist, I've personally written two novels myself that each have a social message embedded within them. But we're not here to talk about my work today. We're actually here to talk about another incredible, amazing author who's doing that in a way that I really honestly could only dream of doing so. Creating content that not only entertains, but can in that story provide perspectives that foster empathy and understanding of one another is a gift that I really, truly appreciate. And if you haven't heard about my guest as of yet, then I am honored to be the one to introduce you to him. So without further ado, the author of 12 novels and counting, Canadian author Wesley King has received over 20 literary awards and seen his books translated for release worldwide. Focusing on middle grade and young adult literature, King is best known for his collaboration with the late Kobe Bryant on the number one New York Times best-selling, best-selling Wizenard series, as well as the Ed- Edgar Award-winning OCD Daniel, which was also a Bank Street Best Book of the Year and Silver Birch winner. His recent release, Sarah and the Search for New Normal, 
For Norma won both the Violent Downey and Ruth and Sylvia Schwartz Awards. Many of his books center around mental health and neurodiverse stories, mirroring his own challenges with anxiety disorders. He splits his time between Nova Scotia, Canada and circumnavigation and a circumnavigation attempt on a creaking 1967 sailboat. Here to talk on the subject of impact through social messaging in fiction novels. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Wesley King. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. And I have to ask, are you on the boat now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, actually. I am back in Canada now, and uh, I've been stuck away from the boat for you know, nine, a year and a half now, of course, with the pandemic. So hopefully it's still floating safely in, in Tunisia where I left it. Oh, wow. Well, what's your favorite thing about being on the boat, if I might ask? Uh, I just like, you know, that, that open feel to it. I like, uh, you know, putting the sails up and going with the wind and it's a really phenomenal place to write because perhaps most effectively it, it, it gives you all kinds of time. Um, you're disconnected, you're off the grid and, uh, and writing is, is one of the best ways to sort of pass the time writing and reading. So it, it provides this really great, uh, escapist place to go and write. And uh, I've done a lot of work aboard that boat actually. <laughs> Sounds amazing. I like that. I get that. The creative process. I'm definitely going to dive into that a little bit more with you later. But I'm, you know, you are the author of several books. And I know I was getting, I, I'm sorry, I'm coming off hiatus. My tongue is still getting used to speaking again. <laughs> but, you know, so many amazing things. I, I don't mean to trip up, because, but I, I'm obviously a, a huge fan. As I said, I, when I reached out, I, I bought your book for my son for Christmas. And so it's an honor to have you here. Let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we know that part of your story is what you did with Kobe Bryant. And we all feel that Kobe's, as well as everyone on that on that flight that day's life was cut way too short. Um, what was the experience like working with Kobe and how does it feel to know you helped co-create something that is forever part of his legacy? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, I guess it's bittersweet in a sense, because as you said, um, it all feels like it was cut way too short and, and um, both for all the tragic victims and then, and then Kobe, of course, who I knew best, he just had this really tremendous creative spirit and he had such a vision for what he wanted to do with his storytelling. And um, there was such a, a social aspect to what he was doing where he was trying to promote literacy in underserved communities. And he had created this, you know, veritable library of ideas in his head that we were working towards. Um, many, many books to come. So, uh, you know, while I'm, you know, I, I guess it doesn't point that he didn't get to see the true breadth of that, that creativity. Um, what he did do, he, it meant so much to him and it means a lot to me. And the Wizenart series is very much a testament to what he really believed in. Um, it's based in sort of um, a lot of the psychological issues and anxieties that kids deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, especially young athletes. And even down to the actual details of the book, which he personally handled, the textures of the books, the way the barcode is designed like a tiger, every little detail of the book, Kobe was so intimately attached to because this really was a passion project for him. This is something that he loved to do. And I just think it's great that he was able to get some of that passion down into a book for kids that will you know, be hopefully shared, as you said, forever. And, uh, and really captures a piece of the, of the spark of creativity that he had. So it was such an honor to be able to work with him on it. Um, and, you know, I, I just know it's done a lot of good and will continue to do so. So I think he's smiling somewhere. I agree. I agree. I love that you speak so passionately about his experience with that and being able to be part of that. Now, you as an author, and I'm an author too, so I kind of have a little insight in on this. My first book felt like a baby. Like, I'm a mother, and it's funny because, you know, you're like, you're creating this, you, you, and when you hold that first version in your hand, I'm like, whoa, and you're giving it. I mean, how is that feeling for you? I want to know, you know, I know how, but like for you, what was it like? Yeah, this is so my uh, well, 13th book comes out in September next month and my 14th next year. Um, and yet it still continues in that process because you put so much, as you well know, you just so much time and energy into it. And, it, you know, it's a reflection of, of yourself and of your spirit. So it's a very personal thing that you're putting out into the world, essentially for critique, you know, for, for enjoyment, but you're putting out a piece of yourself. So there's always still that process. Um, certainly, I, I agree, the first book was perhaps the most harrowing. That's when you are really taking that step from sharing with friends and family to sharing with everybody. Um, and for me, that was, uh, 
back in, well, I was 25 when I put my first book out and, and I've been doing it ever since and sort of um, lots of ups and downs along the way, but, but putting that book out, it, it means so much. And a lot of my books focus on mental health, um, mental health, um, a lot of issues, day-to-day -day issues that kids deal with, whether we're ranging from bullying um, to some more serious stuff as well. And so being able to put that out and, and hopefully connecting with kids, um, that's what kind of keeps me going. That's uh, what I always want to sit down and write. I want to write something that really connects with young readers because for me, I've always enjoyed writing for young readers the most because I find um, that they truly immerse themselves in the books. They take so much out of it. And to be any small part of a positive development for a kid reading a book, um, I just find it to be very, very deeply satisfying. And I know Kobe felt the same way. Um, that's part of the reason that we meshed so well in the beginning. So um, every time I put out a book, it's just kind of waiting to see what the readers think of it and, and you know, hoping for the best. I feel like what happened with you and Kobe, though, was a bit of law of attraction because clearly what he was wanting had to be in alignment with also, you know, he saw you as an, as an author already down that journey. So I, I, we, I'm so excited to talk with you about the mental health with, especially with uh, youth. But before that, I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that storytelling has the power to change our communities and world? And if so, how? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, just firsthand, I'm sure you can attest to this as well, books played such a pivotal role in my development. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be um, in a relatively you know, relatively affluent middle class family. Um, I wasn't facing a lot of the real world issues that a lot of kids are, especially ones in underserved communities. And it still played a massive developmental role for me. It still was the place I turned to when things got tough. Uh, and it still was the thing that helped me connect and find my identity. And so for all kids, it, it's massively important. And, and again, getting them into more of the hands of um, a lot of underserved kids, a lot of kids promoting literacy, kids who are dealing with a lot of social issues, family issues, um, books just provide this, this fantastic backbone, this, um, this ability to escape for a bit, but also to define your identity and to find a lot of inner character. And um, there's just so many people who are using books. Uh, you know, I think of, of one, um, he runs I Love Books, um, and this I Love Books organization is using Wizard Our Books and many other books, bringing them to underserved communities, helping inspire um, a love of reading, which in turn triggers just a general uh, sort of love and education. Um, so I just think that books have always provided this big um, boost for me. And I can see it when I go to schools all around the world, um, just the looks on their faces when they dive into these books, the looks on their faces um, when they read a character that talks like them that sounds like them that is going through the same stuff as them it provides just so much strength for them so i think the books are just a massive part of of becoming uh, of developing as a kid and so uh, you know i'm really passionate about trying to get them to as into the hands of as many readers as possible and uh, just admire everyone who's doing the same thing i agree with the pandemic everything that you're saying is so true i have a, I have two teenagers at home. Of my four children, two of them are teenagers. Mm -hmm. And my 14-year-old daughter, uh, we're in L.A., so they haven't been to school largely for you know a year and a half. Yeah. And she wanted to go to summer camp. And when she went to summer camp, she came home after a couple days, and she says, you know, I don't know how I'm going to go back to regular school because I didn't realize how much energy it is to be around people again. And so needless to say, my daughter does, she is learning to cope with anxiety issues, not only ones that she had prior to COVID, but ones that COVID has exacerbated, right? So I'm looking at kids and I'm looking at a very overwhelmed educational system, you know, that, that I, I'm curious to know what you think they need to be doing to really support these students during the time. And I'm also curious what you've seen has been most effective to, you know, get, because I know I've told my daughter, come on, I'll take you to the, the library and I want to get you books. And she's like, no. And she, she refused me so much. I would buy her books. She didn't want to, she didn't want to read the books I wanted her to read. Fine. I'm so thankful that now she found a book, right? Now she's like, oh, now I want to read. I'm like totally celebrating this. But what have you seen actually work to really get through, to, you know, get them to enticed to read is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, and you raised so many good points there. And in fact, I was just writing um, an essay uh, to be shared sort of in the pre-publication of my newest book, detailing how 
uh, anxiety was so much exacerbated during COVID and, and how it affected you know, people like myself who deal with anxiety disorders and a lot of people who were experiencing for the first time what anxiety can do when it rears its ugly head. And young people have just gone through this, this incredibly harrowing time period, um, this isolationism. And so the effects of that and the anxiety that it's um, imparted on them is, is something that's going to have to be dealt with. And, and I think there's going to be some steps to getting back to, to normalcy or some new level of normalcy. Uh, and books certainly can help. And, and I think the most effective thing is to just tr try and get the books into their hands that have characters that are going through the same things. And that used to be very difficult for kids' books, but anxiety, uh, depression, uh, a lot of different um, developmental disorders are all being featured much more prominently in, in young adult and middle grade literature. And so um, less in terms of educational side, it, it might be tough to get um, a young one who's dealing with anxiety or depression for the first time to sit down and read a, you know, a scientific text on anxiety and the ways to deal with it. But just having a voice in, in a story that maybe is a really engaging story, but the character is going through something that they can identify with, I think can have a massive impact in just finding the voice because a lot of these kids, when they're dealing with anxiety, and I know this from experience, it's such an isolating experience. You feel like you're the only person who's going through these things. So fostering communication at home, uh, fostering communication uh, with peers, uh, and, and even with a professional that's needed, all of that is, is where to start. But I think books can help unlock some of that by just reminding them um, that there are characters and people out there who are going through the exact same experiences as they are. And it's more important now than ever. I totally agree. I have definitely not been intending to skip over that. Yes, you did deal with this personally. I learned that you it was seven. You had you were aware of having it around seven and kept it hidden until you were about 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And that even as an author, you're sharing a part of yourself for the world. I, I relate to undressing just a bit to make others feel that relatability, to not feel so alone. Can you share with us, what are some of the symptoms that we can look for if we see a young, you know, person? What what should we be looking for? What are the symptoms, you know, perhaps at least with regards to what you experienced? Yeah, so you know, initially I was dealing with obsessive compulsive disorder, and it had manifested itself at seven, which is you know young, but it's not uncommonly young. Um, a lot of kids start usually around eight, nine, ten, and happen. And uh, I also deal and have dealt with generalized anxiety disorder and, and panic attack syndrome. Um, so a lot of different. Um, manifestations of anxiety. And so I think I, I've spoken to you because I wrote OC Daniel and a bunch of books that address this. Um, I've met and, and, and constantly speak with many, many people dealing with anxiety around the world. I've, I've met in thousands. I've spoken with teachers and educators and lots of kids on this and still get a fairly steady stream of, of emails from readers um, sort of detailing how they're dealing with their anxiety. And so I can, I've, I've really sensed lately that things have become tough that have become tougher because the pandemic uh, personified a lot of the things that we were always afraid of. And not only did it personify that, but it took away our support systems and our networks and our normalcy and left us feeling very exposed. So for a lot of kids now, um, just as you so rightly pointed out, there's going to be a bit of a hesitation to go back. Um, it's not so easy to just restart all of those social connections, to go back to the everyday issues um, that were so normal for kids before, before it was all focused on, on my friends and, and what I was doing in my social life and, and things like that. And that was all stripped away. And it's now there's a sense of fear of coming back, almost this agoraphobia. Of, um, I'm almost, I was safe. I was told to be safe and sheltered here. And, and now you're asking me to, to turn that over again all of a sudden. So I, I think patience is, is going to be a big thing. Um, it's it's going to take a little time to get back to normal. But for me, my initial um, manifestations of OCD were were very typical. I was flicking light switches, I was counting. Um, but importantly, uh, people who deal with anxiety and mental illness are, are experts at hiding. Um, if they don't want you to see what's going on, it, it sometimes can be very difficult to do so, which is how I kept it hidden for so, so long. So I think the most important thing any parent can do, any friend can do, anyone who has a, a loved one who might be going through something is just to make sure that you're really open for unbiased discussion, um, that they know that those channels of communication are open uh, and that there's no judgment. And that's just going to foster that, that conversation that needs to happen. You bring up something that makes me think of of comments that I've heard. And ironically enough, and I, and I don't, my, I, my four and a half year old is already exhibiting OC. She, is, she has um, an auditory, she has a sensory, you know, and, and, and we see it, but I love her. She's so amazing. She's so unique, right? 
I, I'm aware based on other, from the education of others that the way that we operate in society is normal, especially my grandfather. Like my grandfather was the type of guy who took my, my mother was afraid of heights. He decided to take us up in his Cessna and put it in a nosedive just to get her to like stop being afraid of heights, right? Like it was just that culture of you're going to deal with this. You're going to confront this. And that's how you get better. That's how you get stronger, right? But what I think that has created, a, it has not created a space for somebody who does genuinely experience anxiety to feel that they can say, this does not make me feel comfortable. And then when they give that pushback, we can perceive this as, well, you just need to push past this. And and I'm further, I'm aware that I could be furthering, th further subjecting my child to trauma, right? Because I want her to do it my way. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? And like, how can people, you know, how can we be more aware? How can we be better when dealing with a situation like that? Yeah, it's tough because, you know, the foremost treatment for anxiety um, is cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response prevention. And people probably read that and they see exposure and response prevention, which more or less is facing your fears over and over and over again until the fears diminish. Um, and so, you know, that idea of I'm going to take them up into the, into the hot air balloon or the Cessna to get over the fear. I, it seems like that's what it's telling you. But in fact, of course, there's a very structured approach to that. Um, it's all done in scales and measurements. And you don't start at the most fearful thing and work your way down. Otherwise, it sort of tips the whole process over before it can really begin. So um, I think it's important. And I think that's such a natural response for parents is if, you you know, my my kid's afraid to do something, I'm just going to help push them along to do that very quickly. That was always the answer to it. But uh, that is that anxious reaction to that, um, you could be triggering a panic attack. You could be triggering this massive amount of fear that's it's going to be very unhelpful in the long term so making small steps is, is really the key there and um, there's a ton of great literature on this there's a there's a ton of, of course professional help out there but a lot of the times it's not to the point where professional help is needed i mean if it's not in any way um, affecting the quality of life or it's not creating is any issues like that then it is something that can be worked on at home um, but i think fighting that instinct to to right away force them back into what they're afraid of um that that's important too it should be done in steps and stages and and again, just sort of this judgment-free zone, because when you're in the fit of anxiety, like, you know, again, I've known this, this quite well, it's, there's no reason anymore. It, uh, parents sometimes try to reason with their son, of course, there's nothing wrong with this, but when anxiety takes over, you're not really thinking correctly anymore. There's so many fight or flight hormones flooding through you that you're just instinctually going to shy away or get upset. So again, being patient, realizing that this is a, a new time that we've gone through something, a human experience that's, you know, entirely new to all of us and that you can't just expect to snap our fingers and go back to normal all of a sudden. There are going to be a lot of lingering effects that we have to take our time with and, and help slowly get back to that level of normalcy instead of trying to force it right away. Oh, yeah. I mean, I talk about that on the podcast quite often as well as everywhere I talk because as a cancer survivor uh, I and, and a person who lives with health conditions, there's no back to normal. There's never going to be the day before. The day before Alia was diagnosed with cancer, I'll never be at that place again. You know, not physically, not mentally, like just it, it will never. And my behavior to this day is based on a pre-existing life and experience. So I agree with you. And, you know, I appreciate I, I know you're not a psychologist audience. We're here having the conversation. He has life experience, uh, you know, but I love. So let's go. I, I, and you, I know you've, you've mentioned your book that's coming up. We're going to get into that. I want people to go pre-order it. I'm excited to hear you talk about that. But I do. I was so happy to have my copy here for those who can see on the video version. I've got OC Daniel. Tell us about your creative process and, you know, what how, what is your creative process? process for creating a high impact story because i feel it's very personal to sit down and have that intention right yeah that's that's such a key point um i think a lot of writers who start writing for for young readers in this case of course i write for uh, middle grade and young adult largely there's um it's very important to speak um with them and not to them not down at your readers um to get out of the habit of feeling you need to explain anything or or you need to impart wisdom um that's actually something, you know, it has to happen so naturally through the story. Kids can instinctively recognize when someone is, is lecturing them or speaking down to them and, and they pull back. Um, so for me, it's very much focusing on the characters and making sure they're authentic, making sure the way they speak is authentic and making sure that their thought process and narrative is something that would connect with young readers. Because 
as soon as you put a, too much adult into that character, you're going you're gonna to lose your readers. So for me, I focus very, very much on the characters. It's, that's always central to every book I write. Um, you need an engaging story. A lot of us who write books, there's a theme we want to impart. You know, the theme of O.C. Daniel is that the kids who are dealing with mental health issues are, are not alone uh, and that we have to try and empathize and connect with them. But, but that's not a message that is going to connect kids. So seeding that into the novel and making sure that there's this engaging story. And of course, O.C. Daniel has a murder mystery. It has um, this whole detective aspect. It, it won an Edgar Award which for a mystery award. So it's a mystery book. Um, but the theme that I sent out to impart in it was just seeded throughout. So I think that's important. I think is making sure that the message you're trying to impart doesn't supersede the fact that you have to write a book that's going to be engaging. Um, and so sitting down to write a good story and then going back over time to make sure the theme resonates uh, is definitely more important. So for me, that's really it. It's just making sure it's a book that I want to read. Every book I write is a book that I really want to read myself. Uh, and that's really the only trick to it and, and just kind of sit down and have at it. I, I, I love that you said that it's a book you would want to read, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I always tell people when I buy them a gift, it's a really good gift if I had to decide if I really want to give it to you. <laughs> like, if I had that <laughs> moment where I'm like, well, I kind of like it more for me, then yeah. it's a good gift because that's the type of gifts I want to buy, right? So I feel like the same methodology or, or should apply to the book. What uh, do you, when, you know, and I, I know I'm only, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the, rep, the other 12 here, like I said, but, you know, what, has been you know what is your what is the biggest takeaway you want whether um for any of the books what's the biggest takeaway you want your reader to have as that experience yeah and it, you know it certainly varies a bit um book to book in terms of the central theme that i'm trying to focus on but but always it's just this you know i'm, I'm very passionate about neurodiversity um celebrating our differences about you know celebrating the fact that we're all a little eccentric and weird and, and that we're individuals and that's a really wonderful thing and that's usually when I go around and sort of speak to when I speak to students um, is to celebrate your weirdness in a sense and, and all of my books have characters with eccentricities um, and I just love the fact that you know when kids can move past that point where they're trying to conform to these unrealistic expectations which now are so prevalent I mean they're everywhere they're on they're on the phone staring back at you all day and night and you know, my most recent book this year, I've got the side here, Sarah and the Search for Normal, uh, very much is focused on that as well. Um, she's trying to be like everyone else, and she's trying to do that so badly that it's affecting her in a negative way because she's not celebrating who she is. So honestly, that's probably the most central theme that moves through all of my books, um, from the Wizard series to, to Dragons vs. Drones to the Hello From Here that's coming out later this year. All of these books have that sort of theme of, of celebrating our identity um, and the things that make us weird and how do we transform those into something that's beneficial towards us and that um, lets us, you know, do what we love for a living, um, which is, is always something that, you know, you want to encourage young readers and it sounds a bit um, ridiculous, it sounds a bit cliche, but uh, I do truly believe that whatever form that takes, as long as we're doing something that provides us some sort of purpose and passion, it's, it's going to make us a lot happier. So um, that all stems in, the, in these little kids books, it's, you know. Maybe it sounds a little esoteric, but that's kind of the central theme that I try to work through them all. I love it. I love it. I honor it. I think it's amazing. I mean, it's very, I'm sorry, it's very Mamba mentality, not trying to, you know, it is, it is. <laughs> and and I think that, you know, um, everything that you're saying is so true. It sounds to me, it's like you want people to be seen. How, yeah. when you are with these kids, what are the responses? What are some of the feedback that you've gotten that's really stood out to you? Oh, I mean, I absolutely, I, I love connecting kids. One of the big things I've missed over the last year and a half is the ability to go to festivals and schools and, and to go see the actual readers. Um, because, you know, pictures like this, you know, for those who can see it, there's just, the kids have a blast. And I think, you know, part of it is just, again, I'm a big kid myself, so I connect on a very... Uh, easy level on that side and we have a lot of fun but uh because i care what what they're saying and, and because i know that we all want to learn and we all want to teach too and then you know i think people always kind of forget to allow people whether kids everyone to teach as well and to, and to learn from them and, and we take great joy in that so i'm always trying to get the kids to participate back and teach um and i think that creates this this sense of empowerment that, that's so important um you know 
if I had to think of one that really stood out for me, which I'll never forget, I was um, speaking at, uh, it, it's called the Brampton, uh, the Brantford School for the Blind, um, and sort of visually impaired students from all over the province would come, and they had all read my books um, in Braille, and, uh, and one of the young girls came up who had read all my books and asked me to sign her book for her, and so when I took the, uh, the book to sign it, she sort of stopped me, um, she had an aide with her, and handed me a scented marker. And so I signed the book with a scented marker and she held it up to her face and, and breathed it in and, and sort of said thank you and knew exactly where to sort of find the signature in the future. And I thought that was just such a beautiful reminder of how important books are. And, and it was just a great reminder of how these words, however they're translated, however they're presented can, can really be impactful. So for me, those are the, those are the great moments. That's what make writing, uh, that's what makes writing worth it for me. That is incredible. I love that. I love that. I love that because, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Life is what it is. It is what we make of it. And for often people marginalize others that have a challenged ability or a disability and to see that to, to that there's always a way. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? And I find from people who are challenged, you can often be inspired because they are finding the work around. They're not giving up just because it's difficult, right? So just the story that she had the scented marker, how incredible and that she could smell. When you said it, I took a deep breath in because I just like, that, that's incredible. I, I never would have thought about that. And the reason why that's even more significant, I am going to give this my current my current novel that I'm working on right now has a blind individual in it because somebody who was blind said, can somebody please create a character that isn't like, you know, bumping into walls and stuff like that? Can somebody show how, you know, just how amazing we can be? And so I love that you said that. That was the universe. Sorry if I put something like that in my book, but I just honestly, that is amazing. I, I won't. It. If I do, I'll have to give you credit. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love it. I look forward to reading that because I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, for me, again, celebrating the differences rather than treating them as some sort of disability. That's what I want to see in books. Right. You know, that's right. what I love. That's, that's what resonates with me. That's so cool. Okay. Hello from here. Please tell us about it. How did it come about? What do we need to know? Because that com that's on pre-order right now on Amazon. Yeah. People go yeah. get it. Pre-order because it comes out, what, September 21st? Uh, September 7th. It's really coming Oh, September up. 7th. That's right. Okay. Yeah. September 7th. My yeah. <laughs> so sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. It's, yeah, it's, it's. It's really exciting. Um, Chandler, um, Chandler and I were connected to our agents. For those who don't know Chandler Baker, she's amazing. Um, she wrote Whisper Network, which was a, a Reese's Book Club pick and a big um, bestseller. And her new book, The Husbands, was just announced yesterday as, as the Good Morning America Book Club pick and uh, is being turned into a film right now. And Kristen Wiig is as the star. So Chandler's wow. having, having a great year. And uh, I was lucky enough to get to work with her last year on this. And so our agents presented and, and you know, we knew we want to, we both had been banding this around, you know, to our ages respectively, that we want to write something during COVID. And, and it was difficult to sort of, um, because of the weight of it and, and how to do something, not light, but something that kids could connect to throughout the process um, of what they were all going through. And so we ended up writing Hello From Here, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a YA love story. And it, it's, um, we actually wrote it. Chandler and I have never even met physically because we met during the pandemic. Of course, she lives in Austin, Texas, and I'm up in, in Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, she took one character, I took the other, and we alternated chapters and, and almost wrote it back and forth like letters where a chapter would come to me, I would respond to it, go back to her. Um, so we went through this process and, and wrote this this really funny, this really heartfelt novel that, of course, is dealing with such weighty themes. Um, but we really want to get to the root of the teen experience because I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, shame or guilt in saying that, you know, I miss the fact that I didn't get my prom. I miss the fact that my year was sort of disrupted. And, and of course there are so many more serious issues and, you know, it's not to minimize the overall, the tragedy of the situation, but we want to say that, you know, it's okay to, to feel bad that you missed your senior year. It's okay to feel bad that you didn't get to see your friends for a few months. I mean, those are, those are issues. And so we want to tell a story that sort of, you know, moved around that a little bit, and of course, dealt with a lot of the severity of COVID-19, but also was this love story and this, this portrayal of how two teens who just met might actually connect in a world where they're not allowed to get close to each other in a world that's, you know, trying very, trying very hard to separate everybody. So I think it's a really great novel, and uh, I, I can't wait to share it, yeah, because, uh, you know, Chandler's a terrific 
author. So, you know, half of it's going to be really good. And I tried to carry my weight as well. So we'll see. I think the um, the entire book is going to be amazing, first of all. Yeah, and, <laughs> but I love your modesty. See, that's why you guys have to buy the book, first of all. Um, uh, but I think that as a as a creative, we can be challenged with the task of, is it something we what we really want to talk about right i know that for me within media you have this balance of not wanting we have to talk about it we're dealing with it some mm -hmm. people don't want to talk about it denial you know denial feels really good <laughs> ignorance is bliss but we're all living through this experience and i feel that it is up to us creatives to create that content that supports us we've all just gone through this collective trauma together mm -hmm. So I love that you both came together and created this story so timely. Because also as an author and a creative, it's important that the things, you know, they fall in line. Yeah. I mean, there are some things that are evergreen, of course, but then there's this that's in the moment. It's going to offer that support and once again, not make when someone feel so alone and isolated. Um, what was your favorite part about the book writing process, though, this time? Aside from the that was really cool, the back and forth. I like that. But was there anything else that really was your favorite part? Yeah, I mean, it was such a different process. I've, I've never, uh, when Kobe and I were collaborating, he was the idea man. Kobe had a never ceasing um, uh, stream of ideas and he was so detail oriented. So he would throw out ideas. I would process them essentially into a book, come back to him, and then we would just work on the editing together. Uh, this was my first time truly collaborating in terms of alternating chapters and, and really leaving half of the book up to another author. And of course, that can be disastrous uh, for, and, and has been for any number of um, uh, prospective uh, partnerships in writing a book in the past. But I think because Chandler and I were both, um, we're both very easygoing people. We both really respected each other's abilities. And so being able to trust the other person to take care of their side and feeding off that and, and letting each other, you know, build, I would get back something from her that I loved so much that I was like, well, I better write something good too. And, and sort of created this really uh, great partnership throughout. And uh, I do think it was difficult to balance um, instilling humor and, and humanity and a little bit of levity into this pandemic, this trauma, as you just said, uh, is a fine tightrope to walk. And again, it's not to make light of anything that anyone went through. It's just to remember that there were human stories still happening. Um, people were still falling in love. People were still in love. People, relationships were coming and going. There were still issues going on throughout. And, and to get a little snapshot of, of what it looked like in the early days of the pandemic. It's set in California, Southern California. Um, and to get a little snapshot of what that was like for a team, you know, maybe it's like a time capsule for the future where they can go back and look at, maybe for the ones who lived through it, it's something that they can relate to. But I hope it just, um, again, I, and it's hard with the story about, about kids and about characters. The main character that I wrote is dealing with anxiety, uh, suffering through an anxiety disorder through the pandemic, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, and it's just set in this backdrop of, of what we all just went through. So, again, I, I hope just the humanity of it shines through. And, and that was the part I enjoyed writing the most. I'm sure I will. And obviously, from my monologue, this is why I loved having you as a guest. See, it's 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 growing with the flow of what happens to us in life. I think your your story completely embodies that and what you're trying to give to others. Um, I do agree with you. We're living through a time. I tell my kids all the time. We're living through a point of history right now that for a long time to come, they will look back and say, what were these people doing? No differently than we look back in 1918. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone will be looking back at 2020 and, you know, however, and, and even to me and I'm I, I am candid in this. We're, we're still moving through a pandemic. It's not done. Yeah. We're not done. Uh, you know, I believe in being responsible because I care about others around me. And, you know, so we know that life can be so challenging. You've written these incredible books. You have had your own experiences. With that, what advice do you have for someone who is wanting to, to grow with the flow and take this experience and allow it to make them perhaps stronger, more, you know, better at communication. And, you know, instead of retreating, like we often want to, you know, how do you grow with the flow? Yeah, it's a great question. And certainly one I um, still reflect on myself all the time. I mean, I'm somebody who still deals with, uh, with anxiety disorders and, and has had a tough time, with, just like many of us, you know, I lost uh, a great friend last year in Kobe and dealt with Sort of the, the grief afterwards of that and a lot of that was was growing and, and trying to get back to the stage um where i was creating again myself but 
I think there's just so much to it. I, I, you know, I think for me, all the people around me that I find are dealing the best with this. And, and of course, um, outside factors aside, you know, so many of us have had to deal with either deal with COVID ourselves or, or have family and loved ones. And, and you know, of course, I uh, have to have to deal with the loss and the trauma. But, but the people in general who seem to handle all these things the best are, are almost to, to a T, the, the people who seem to have the most empathy and kindness and compassion for others. I think uh, a lot of us, what happens is when we get afraid, we turn inward. I mean, this is very Star Wars here, but, you know, fear becomes this inward sort of anger and we, we become a little bit reclusive and the world starts to become a scary place again. And um, that makes it hard to grow. It makes it hard to roll with the flow if, if you're so worried about everybody else uh, who's out to get you and things like that in terms of um, these outside factors. When you have anxiety, you get uh, very reclusive. Um, the a lot of us had taken to sort of getting out of the world a little bit. And so now getting back into it uh, is going to be difficult. But again, I think just empathy and kindness and compassion, um, there has been good things that have come through this. So much more social awareness, um, both in the States, both in Canada as well. We've, we've had some you know recent really horrible discoveries in, in the treatment of the Indigenous peoples. But there just seems to be a lot more, hopefully, social awareness coming, hopefully social change. Hopefully this is somehow going to bring us closer together and allow us to see the humanity in each other a little bit more. And I think that, you know, a little humility, all these things thrown in is the best. But again, to a T, the people who I know who seem to be rolling along the best are, are just the ones I generally consider to be the really kind people. Kind people just are, are, are pretty great at rolling with the flow because they're just really good at seeing the positive side of things. And I, I know it's tough, um, but uh, kindness just seems to go an awful long way. I agree. Last season, our theme was um, silver linings, you know, so I agree. And in, in, in order, you can't have the good without the bad. That's the reality. It's the law of nature, positive and negative in every single thing around us, including our own bodies. And, you know, I agree with you. As an author, for someone who identifies with you and your journey, if they're wanting to aspire to be an author, what are some of the first steps that they need to be taking? What do you, you know, what do you suggest as being, um, yeah, that first step towards a journey of being as incredible of an author as you are? <laughs> <laughs> well, shoot for higher, first of all. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd really go, you know, next level up, you know. But uh, no, I mean, there's... <laughs> There's a ton of practical steps, of course, in terms of um, breaking down your actual draft. You could be here. That's it. You know, many other podcasts to come. Uh, you know, the most basic stuff, of course, is, is, to, is to read voraciously. Uh, anyone who likes to, who wants to write should read a ton. Uh, you know, that's Stephen King's sort of go-to advice as well, is just read a ton. Uh, that really helps develop your sense of story and helps inspire you at the same time. Um, and then when you're sitting down, I, I think just really write what you know, write what you love. If, if you're getting started, that's really the place to start it, is find that personal story, something that connects with you. It doesn't matter if it's set in space, it doesn't matter if it's fantasy, as long as the heart of it is something that you know and love. I think that authenticity is really going to separate you as you come out. Um, it's easy to start a book. It's, it's not easy to finish one. You're going to go through a lot of doubts. You're going to have some self-confidence, some self, you know, or some existential crises along the way. Having the confidence to finish your book is so key and, and knowing that you can go back then and edit it and help create or help get it back to the vision you started with is so key. But I, yeah, that's the main thing that trips up every new author seems to truly be self-confidence uh, self and they let it slide somewhere along the way and, and start losing faith in themselves and the idea and it never sees the light of day. So give yourself the chance. Uh, step one is finish that book and then go see where it goes from there. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Can you technically go back to your books and still edit? Like if you like, I feel like I could forever go back to my forever. book and still edit it. Like forever, I could change yeah. that. Um, <laughs> oh, what is your, and this is more of a, a, a question to you as a reader, what are a couple of your favorite books? What are the books that make you go, oh my gosh, you have to read this? Yeah, good question. And, and I read a, a really sort of diverse mix of um of everything, adult, kids look, uh, kids books, uh, sort of all over the place. Uh, I read via audiobooks a ton, uh, sort of almost as a break from physical books when I'm just driving or at the gym or something. I'm sort of a book plugged in 95% you know, of the time. And, and often it's, uh, you know, I'm a, a still a big fan of, of epic fantasy and sci-fi, but uh, I also really connect with a lot of these um, more personal stories. I, I'm, 
one of the good things about being an author is publishers just send you books and people send you books to blurb them all the time. So I always have a fairly steady stream of books coming in um, that have been great. And uh, for the middle grade readers, there's, there's one, you know, I'd, I'd really love to recommend, which is called Thanks a Law Universe. Um, it's by Chad Lucas. And uh, for anyone looking for a, a middle grade book that's really about finding your identity, um, this is such a great book that just came out. And I, you know, it's one that I've learned and thought was really fantastic. So, that, so that's for your middle grade readers there. Um, yeah, and right now for, for the adult readers, I mean, I, of course, I got to promote Chandler, Chandler Baker. So uh, uh, the, the Husbands and Whisper Network are both really great choices for those adult readers right now. And I'm sure if you're part of the Good Morning America Book Club, I mean, those are already on to it. But those are some books that are, are coming out or just came out that are worth reading. Those are awesome. I love it. I love it. Aside from purchasing your books, how can people support you and what you're doing? Yeah, great question. I mean, uh, again, uh, certainly you can follow along on social media and uh, for all authors, uh, you know, if you get a chance and if you read a book and you enjoyed it, I, I know all authors, I speak for all of them and we love to see reviews and stuff like that. It helps uh, just boost the visibility of the book and helps other people see it. But, but really in terms of, um, you know, for my end, it's, you know, I'm concerned about getting the books in the hands of readers. So, you know, promote those little free libraries. If you uh, can donate your books or help purchase books for local underserved schools and communities like that, all that kind of stuff, anything that gets the books, uh, gets books in the hands of more readers is, is a big win. So whatever you can do to help promote literacy, um, finding local organizations, again, like I Love Books and things like that, that are doing this work and, and helping support them. I think that's just uh, really the best thing to do right now. And, and more stories for kids is, is a good thing. So whatever we can do to promote that is a win. Agreed, agreed. Uh, for the listening audi audience, your IG is at Wesley King Author. And your website is www.wesleyking.com. Yes. Uh, yeah, WesleyTKing.com. So Wesley T. King. Sorry, it here. is on the lower corner. Sorry, I just couldn't read that far away. No, I was no cheating. Worries. I was cheating. I wasn't looking at my notes. I'm looking at the screen. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I appreciate you coming on and having the conversation with me. I think that your work is amazing. So it's fantastic that you got to work with, you know, with Kobe Bryant. I think that that is a huge thing. But at the same token, the way that I am, I just can't help but celebrate everything else that you do. And I hope that others will take the time to recognize that though that is one amazing project, you're doing all of these other incredible things. So we have O.C. Daniel, you have Sarah in the New Normal, and then we have Hello From Here coming out soon. Uh, is there anything else in the pipeline? Yes, there's another book coming out next year that I'm super excited to share. It's another very close um, family story. Uh, my little brother having been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which uh, is no longer the diagnosis, but it, now it's usually um, autism spectrum disorder that's part of it. But there's many, many of people running around um, who have still identified with Asperger's, and that's still very commonly used in the vernacular. Um, and he is just this amazing guy. He's He was told as a kid, you know, many times over and over again that he was going to live at home forever, that he was never going to uh, be able to form meaningful relationships because he was... Um, Again, going with Asperger's syndrome at that time, but you know he's uh, getting married. Um, you know, next year owns a home, has a job, and I just love celebrating the story. I love celebrating neurodiversity in terms of to stop treating autism spectrum disorder and and all of the spectrum um, as a disability versus something to be celebrated. Because I know so many people uh, who are some uh, aspect of the spectrum who are just some of the most wonderful people I know. So celebrating those, and and that's this book coming out next year really is going to do. It's a, it's a middle, grade, middle grade book coming out next year. So to I celebrate love, autism spectrum disorder. I love that. I love that because as I've shared with you, my four and a half year old is on the spectrum. And when Laura Kimpton, who was here, the daughter of the, uh, the hotel year, the Kimpton Hotels, I remember she corrected me and I loved that she did it because she's dyslexic. So Laura Kimpton is very known for the megalithic uh uh, installations that she does the xo xo the love letters and i remember saying dyslexia as a disability and she said she says you know what i see it as an ability you know and and i think that that is incredibly important you're right the way that we speak about it i'm very you know i i recognize i don't always say the right things but i do not want to limit somebody i want to have the perspective like you just said that we are diverse and these 
differences amongst us do not mean that that person is still not a beautiful freaking miracle, right? Mm -hmm. So I love all that you're doing. I so appreciate that you came and had this conversation with me. I hope when you get to Los Angeles or when I'm up in Canada, we can get to connect in person at some point. But uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's greatly appreciated. I appreciate you. All right. Well, to you at home, thank you so much for being with us. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. I want a couple remind you, be sure to connect with us on uh, Clubhouse, Club Unsugarcoated, if you're there. Don't forget to stay connected with me on IG, Alia, A-A-L-I-A, underscore unsugarcoated. Subscribe, comment, drop me a note, whatever. But just, you know what? Keep coming back. Until next time, I thank you so much. Thanks for letting us be unsugarcoated. What are you still doing here? Come back next week.